All right, now welcome everyone. I am Heather Bhandari, adjunct lecturer in visual arts. And it is my pleasure to welcome you today to our third visiting artist lecture of the 2023-2024 season. And um, this is our final um, visiting artist talk of the semester. Tonight, I'm pleased to introduce Derek Adams, an inspiring multidisciplinary artist who has grown his practice publicly and exponentially in the last decade. But for several decades, he's been known by many as not only an artist, but a supportive arts administrator, a DJ, and an advocate for artists. Before we go any further, I'd like to begin with a living land acknowledgement. Brown University is built on what is now called College Hill, part of the unceded ancestral homelands of the Narragansett Indian tribe. Indigenous people from many nations, near and far, live, study, and work in Providence today. The amplification of native voices and histories is crucial to rectifying the many violent legacies of colonialism, and we gratefully acknowledge the ongoing critical contributions of indigenous people within this university and across our state, region, and nation. In addition, I'd like to acknowledge that we are connected by a campus that relied on the African slave trade in the Americas, and that there are buildings on campus constructed by enslaved people. We recognize that land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustained and enriched the stolen land we're speaking from today. These acknowledgments and much more commit us to a lifetime of decolonial and anti-racist work. Um, now I'd like to thank Ed Osborne, the Chair of Visual Arts, Christine Dodd, Winnie Geyer, CJ Liu, and Media Services for facilitating this evening's event. A few more things to note before we start. First, please do not record this event. We value and respect the IP of our visiting artists, and we will post our recordings on our YouTube account only with their permission. Still shots are great, but just please tag at Brown Visual Arts and at Derek Adams NY. Second, after Derek's presentation, there will be a Q&A that I hope is really active. There are two microphones in the room that will be passed, so just raise your hand as soon as you have a question. It's expected that everyone be kind and curious and respectful in their questions and that each person asks one question. Okay, and now for our fabulous guest, Derek Adams. Derek Adams was born in 1970 in Baltimore, Maryland. He's a multidisciplinary artist living and working right now in Brooklyn, New York. He received his BFA from Pratt University and graduated with an MFA from Columbia University in New York in 2003. Adams has held numerous teaching positions and is currently a tenured assistant professor in the School of Visual Arts, Media, and Performing Arts at CUNY Brooklyn College. He also holds an honorary doctorate degree from MICA in Baltimore. Um, Derek celebrates and expands the dialogue around contemporary black life and culture through scenes of normalcy and perseverance. He's developed an iconography of joy, leisure, and the pursuit of happiness within a practice that encompasses paintings, sculptures, collages, performances, videos, and public projects. So hopefully that covers a lot of what you all are working on today. Um, Derek synthesizes representational imagery with planar cubist geometry to produce multifaceted figures and faces that address the richness of the black experience. In 2022, um, Derek established Charm City Cultural Cultivation, an organization to support and encourage underserved communities in the city of Baltimore through events conducted, conducted by three entities. First, the Last Resort Artist Retreat, which is a residency program that subscribes to the concept of leisure as therapy for the black creative. Two, the Black Baltimore Digital Database, which is a collaborative counter-institutional space for collecting, storing, and safekeeping the data of local archival initiatives. And three, Zora's Den, an online community of black women writers started in January 2017, which has since expanded into in-person writing workshops, a writer's circle, and a monthly reading series that strives to promote instruction, support, and social engagement. Derek has been the subject of solo exhibitions at institutions that are so numerous to name. I will name a few. Uh, the Cleveland Museum of Art is one in 2022. The Monument, um, Momentary at Crystal Bridges Museum in Bentonville, Arkansas. The Hudson River Museum and Yonkers and Museum of Art and Design. Those are just a few. And he's mounted public installations commissioned through Art and Amtrak at New York Penn Station, which many of the students saw last spring. Um, 
the MTA Art and Design at the Nostrum Avenue LIRR station in Brooklyn, and RX Art at New York City Health and Hospitals in Harlem, which is ongoing. His work has been featured in many, many, many group exhibitions, including the culture, hip hop, and contemporary art in the 21st century at the Baltimore Museum of Art in Baltimore, that's um, this year, and Package Black, Derek Adams, and Barbara Earl Thomas at the Henry Art Gallery in Seattle. And there are many more. He's also in a lot of different collections, including um, the Met, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond, and the Birmingham Museum of Art, among many others. His resume is clearly impressive, and his engagement with the art world, students, and underserved voices is very inspiring. So please join me in welcoming our guest, Derek Adams. Thank you, everyone. Um, so happy that everyone had made time to be here to hear me talk about some of the things I am doing. And it's so funny, you know, always the reason why I started the Last Resort Arts Retreat is because, you know, sometimes I think a lot of cultural workers, primarily a lot of black cultural workers working in within the inner city, do so much is that we actually need to hear people re read it out <laughs> to know exactly how much we're doing because we do so much that we, don't, we forget how much we do because it's so necessary. We don't do it necessarily all the time because we want to do it. And a lot of things that I've done in Baltimore and other places not because I want to do it, it's because it's necessary and someone has to do it. And I think that um, ends up being you know, how you see and how you read and how we see legacy building, but it kind of starts out of seeing necessity and filling in the blanks where it's needed. But when people always ask me, um, you know, when I do things, like, why do you do it? If I didn't have to do it, I wouldn't do it, honestly. I would just paint in my studio or do whatever I'm doing in my studio. I just feel like when I'm, you know, one of the reasons why I started a lot of things I've started community-wise is because, you know, when you become more um, international with your movement and you see all the opportunities happening for people around the world and you're from a city where opportunity is not always accessible, you have to be... You know, you have to have a kind of a realization that if certain things will happen, sometimes you have to make it happen. And so a lot of the things that has happened in Baltimore, where I'm from, is based on my desire to push uh, opportunity forward for my hometown. So when I come home, I won't be the only one at the head of the table because I don't really think of myself as being that type of person. So a lot of the things I've done is just because I don't want to be the center even though I'm the center right now, but normally I don't want to be normal most of the time. So anyway, without further ado, um, I do a lot of different things, and um, I decided to condense a lot of the things I've, I've done into a particular theme for tonight, because I remember I did this talk at Skowhegan, maybe like 2013, 2014, and I did Skowhegan in 2002, and I was invited to come back in 2015, and I showed like all of my stuff, I remember it took like two hours or whatever. And I remember someone said to me, that was a lot of stuff. You didn't have to show. One of, the, one of the participants came up to me and said that. And so I always remember that because, you know, I felt like I had to kind of like go back down memory lane because I was a participant and I was invited to come back as a visiting artist. So I was kind of like showing out a little bit. So now, you know, I'm kind of streamlining things to start based on the theme uh, which was a body of work that I started in, two, in 2010, was called Live and in Color. And so, you know, growing up in a city like Baltimore, where, you know, the city is primarily, uh, the demographic is probably 70% maybe of black people, the other 30% um, other people, and most of the people who live on the outskirts of Baltimore, the idea of like otherness did not really exist for me in my my years of growing up. It was more about critiquing each other and, you know, things like how, you know, how people kept their house or, you know, or who went to church and who didn't. So my reality was not based on, like, comparative, uh, comparative uh, understanding of other non-black people. And so moving into New York, and although I had, like, a lot of experience with, you know, tra traveling and being in a family that travels, I never really thought about my culture as a black person as it compares to other things because I was 
seeing products of, of, of accomplishment happening around me. So my work, as, you know, as people see it, is really based on my personal experience of being a black person exposed to certain things. And so a lot of my work is really not about the idea of joy per se, it's about normalcy that's transferred to the idea of joy because the work is, is being seen as something of an anomaly when you think about what's being made in the art world. So the idea of joy is something that I'm not saying that my work doesn't project, but I think that normalcy for most people who are like me, joy is something that you have to take. It's not something that's given. And so when you hear about my work in Black Joy, yes, it's being taken. It's not something that's being offered. And so when you look at my work, it's political in a way that you think about blackness because I purposely decided from graduate school that I'm gonna make the work that I'm making. And that's why you see my work that's created this whole idea of joy or black joy, but it's really just me wanting to mirror my experience and my, my community is the way I feel and the way that I experience them in my work. So um, that said, I'm gonna move right into the work. Um, so I want to start with uh, the idea of media. So you know, growing up, I always thought about media and a representation of black. Uh, the figure in media was always very complicated to me because I enjoyed some of the kind of the representation and exaggeration of the black characteristics that would exist on TV. It happens now. It happened before. There are people who actually mirror some of the things that you see on TV in real life. And there's always like this conversation about stigma, about different forms of like exaggeration and things that we as black people experience in our own community. And sometimes we see it mirrored on television. And so my work really kind of kind of came out of that kind of came out of that idea. Um, starting like right after graduate school, I was thinking about TV. I was thinking about the way uh, black people represent are represented in media and the way we represent ourselves. And those two things to me are very interesting because I actually like to see forms of exaggeration of black characterization on TV. It's something that within the black culture we laugh about, we talk about in a very particular way. And so I became really interested and fixated on that. So at one point in 2010, I started looking at old sitcoms and shows that I, was, that I grew up on um, and looking at it more critically. Because you know, at that point, I went through Columbia. I went through the critical theory. I started thinking about representation from a very analytical way, from a very uh, aesthetic, aesthetic way, thinking about it as it relates to our history and the representation of the black image and just the idea of media and media influence. And I started really thinking about the nuances of representation with the black figure. And so this particular piece is called uh, Boxhead. And so it kind of came out of this idea of the talking head and thinking about representation on the media. I don't know if people must remember, but in Baltimore is where uh, Oprah Winfrey got her first start as an anchor. And she's a, also one of the first anchors to wear Afro. And the idea of representation or black representation on the media is so profound and so critical and also so um, visceral the way that people actually respond to it. And, um, and so I really started thinking about it. And even as an artist now, when I'm looking at like a news, like I have a lot of humor when I'm thinking about my work. And sometimes when I'm looking at news anchors on TV, I'm looking at their accessories. I'm like, why she got this necklace on and this, all this like statement jewelry? She's doing the, we the weather. Why she's doing all that, you know? I think about the aesthetics of certain things when I think about representation. And it plays a really major part in the way I construct images that even mirror those things or project those things out or amplify those things. And so for me, the talking head sculptures really talked about the kind of angularity of the way that we present ourselves because I think that we are really, as black people, we're, all, we're very involved in symmetry. We always think about like parts in the middle of our head, how they have to be a certain way or the braid has to be the same on this side as that side. It's the idea that it's very mathematical when you think about the culture that we represent and so I started to think about that in a very analytical way. And so these sculptures in the cubist structure that I've started to uh, form in 2009, 2008, was really based on my interest as a black American and the idea of African sculpture, how to kind of push it forward to talk about like popular culture, traditional African forms, 
and kind of talk about uh, um, uh, art history. So um, the box heads became part of my show at Jack Tilton in 2000, at 20, 20, 2012. It was called Live and in Color, and it was really um, highlighting the amplification of the black of the black figure in media. And so all the images that I made that related to that theme were really like very brightly colored. And I actually used the color balance of the color bar to, um, to create the work. So the color bar and the colors that existed within the color bar was the structure that I used to compose all the images. The only to tones that I did not use that were uh, added were the tones, the brown tones of the, of the skin. Everything else were mostly the colors that exist during the color bar um, um, structure uh, for TV. Um, so a lot of these things were like really, I was looking at shows that I grew up on. Like I grew up in the 70s, 80s. I, I watched shows like What's Happening, Good Times, um, the Jeffersons, uh, different strokes, you know, like I had no, in my time growing up, representation was not something that was, uh, I felt denied. I felt like it was a beginning of seeing differentness in, within black culture and thinking about what I experienced personally being mirrored and also being interpreted through television. So. Being a grown up now and being an artist now, I went back to those places and watched these things on YouTube, looked at them very carefully, looked at some of the characteristics of the representation of the figures and realized how American it was. To me, I felt like when I started looking at cinema and look, started looking at different things that you start to compare Africanism and Americanism, I saw a very particular reference and fracturedness of Africanism within black culture in a very unique way that's very influential. And for me, that gave me a whole sense of motivation to really talk about the idea that w even within this kind of transition, you cannot really deny either one. You know? And so for me, it actually released me out of this idea of representing, or the idea of representing. My work is really more about what I care about and what I want people to see when it relates to black culture from a global standpoint. So. I actually look at my work solely um, as an aesthetic uh, exercise because I believe that aestheticizing blackness is very, also very important because there's elements within the culture that, that are very influential and we don't really think about it when we think about art. You know, and even when we're in shows as artists, a lot of times if you read the labels, they never talk about the aesthetic principles of our work. And so for me, it's important to, for me to really stress this in my work because not only my work relates to other non-aesthetic issues, I think about aesthetics, aesthetics when I'm making everything in my studio because when you go to an academic experience and you learn the basic principles of making work, you cannot unknow those things. But the way that you present those things in art is something that you have to, as a black person, you have to be very deliberate in making sure that the work is framed, that people can understand that you're not only interested in a subject or a theme or an idea, you're also interested in presenting an object that is comparable to any other object being made and put in a museum. So that's my interest as an artist. This is another version of uh, the work within um, that series. Um, this is part of an exhibition um, at Pioneer Works. If anyone knows that space that's in Red Hook, I was invited to do a piece there. I, I continued. That was in 2020, 2016. I was invited to do an installation in the museum, I mean, in the space. And for that, for that installation, I really just thought about um, the ideas of, of television and media in a very different way. I started to think about the material as the ingredients to build the body of work. So these particular pieces are called uh, Constellation, Color Bar Constellation, and I started to fuse. Because when I think about black culture, I think about color. You know, color is such a significant part, I think, of black culture when you think about all the things that represent the way we step out of the house. You know, like if you grew up in like a Southern Baptist format, you follow color all the time. It was a, you wear certain colors on certain, certain days, whatever, whatever reason. I grew up in a family with mostly uh, strong women. 
Um, I, as a kid, we would drive around to numerous malls to find the right stockings to go with the right dress because it had to be a certain blue to go with a certain blue dress. And they would call each other and say, girl, if you're at the mall, um, they would show each other. They would, in my family, women would come to each other's houses with their outfit and say, if you're going out to the mall today, I need this. And so if you can find something to match this, let me know. And my mom and her sister would call each other from outside in the mall and say, I found those, that, that shirt you were looking for, of a, of that royal blue is here. I found those tights, this tone of blue. I grew up in a space where color was very significant to representation. If it was a day that you were in church and you had to wear a white shirt and a black skirt, you could not wear an off-white shirt. It had to be a white shirt. If it, wasn't, if it was off-white, they'd be talking about you. You know what I'm saying? It had to be white. So the idea of color became very prominent in the way that I started looking at art and looking at uh, representation as a, as a person. So it really seeped into the way I started making art because I was very aware of tones and certain things that tones did because I was brought up in a space where colors represented certain celebrations. So in these works, I uh, infused different representations of things that I also was very interested in in media and a cover of the magazine, Jet Magazine, uh, or a TV guy and Jet Magazine in these, but they were also uh, images that represented, um, I guess, main cast figures who were black. And so the works in this particular uh, body of, of works um, really was more about the explosion of color. It was about the explosion of the personalities that existed. And I, you know, in my work, I always think about things that I care about and things that I think that are important and you sometimes don't have evidence of how they affect people. But I had this really interesting conversation one time with um, someone who told me, a non-black person told me that when they were a kid, they were forbidden to watch Moesha. And I laughed. I was like, why? Why would you? My parents would not let me watch Moesha. I was like, that show? With Brandy? But that, but, but that really made me more aware of like, the influence that black representation has on, t on people on TV and that there are parents who believe that a starring cast of, of black people can have a negative effect on their non-black kid. And so for me, I thought that was really interesting because I know it has an effect on me, but I'm also, I also understand the idea of media representation versus reality. And so I believe as a black person that a lot of representation of black culture presented in media is a large influence in the way that people understand black culture, even if it's misinformation. And so my work is really highlighting the things that I feel are very important for people to understand when it comes to the aesthetics of black culture and the representation of it through art. So these works, uh, which are color bar constellation, were, were a part of an installation at Pioneer. This particular work was coming from my show at Jack Tilton. Um, it was called Pilot. It was, you know, when I was looking through a lot of images on YouTube of different shows I was looking at, and I was looking at, like, again, like some of these shows, I noticed that a lot of the formulaic structure, which exists throughout all television, was happening in a lot of the shows that I watched growing up. And I realized this is the reason why I may feel more empowered about looking at myself as a black person and also understanding the complexity and the diversity within black culture. But also I realized the idea that archetypes were being created when I look at older shows from the 70s and 80s. I realized that was the beginning of archetypes that represented this idea of Americanism with black culture. So I would look at certain shows and see similar hairstyles on some of the kids. I would see certain things that were very important. So this partic these particular works that are, um, part of this particular series of collages. These are all collage fabric, cardboard, um, shelf liner. This is like a composite of a, a bunch of different characters. This could be uh, Rudy. This could be D. This could be many different characters from different sitcoms where the little sassy girl sister who um, told people how, how it is, you know. And for me, I created this, these images as a way of talking about the power of representation, but also the, the, 
the power we have as artists to create alternative representations um, through our understanding of how media works. And so this work kind of came out of kind of like stretching my, I try to, I try to, to, to really flex my, uh, my imagination and my creative muscle when I'm making work. I believe in the words of, you know, like um, one person that I love, uh, Bell Hooks. She said, you know, it's not just about telling it like it is, it's also about presenting other ideas for people to think about, reflect on. And I think that we have the power to do these things too. And I believe that with my work, I, I think about the future. I think about the future generations and what I want to leave behind for them to see. This particular image also is also looking at the form of uh, black gay representation on television and how you know it's presented in many different ways as this kind of comic relief structure that also um, is empower, empowering in some way because usually those characters are the ones who tell people off. They're the ones who have the most attitude. Is a whole other thing that happens that they're able to do from this kind of persona image that's, that they are able to um, exist within, within the, you know, the confines of media, but also they leave, a lot of, they leave a great impression on communities. They leave a great impressions on the ideas relating to uh, gender. And we know it when we see it. Like we, I think in our culture, when we see characters like this on TV or characters, we talk about this at home, like we know what these characters are. We understand we have relatives like this. It's, it, we exist in this space um, where we, we uh, look, at these, look at these individuals as powerful figures in my community and where I grew up. Um, and so when I'm making work and I'm presenting work, I'm thinking about what I want to put in the world and what I, how I want to think about um, iconic muses that exist in the art and will exist beyond me. So this particular character is coming from uh, uh, Men on Films. And so this is a very particular scene that I use as a reference. But this reference is very much common in a lot of designing women. Um, you think about all these different shows, they, you know, the characters exist. This is another image. I always think about this too. When you look at like reality shows, when they first come on, all of the singers, most of the singers are black women. They all sound good. But as black people know, they're going to cancel each other out before the end of the season, and only one is going to be left. And we know this is in black culture. Other non-black people don't even know this. We know when we watch American Idol and it's like 10 black women singing, we know that only one of those women is going to be left because if it was just all of them on the stage, it would just be amazing. But it can't be. So we know these things. So these are things that, again, these are things that I know, and I know within the culture, and we talk about, and I present it in my work, and I don't have an explanation for it. I don't have like a, like a script for it. I just present it because these are things that I know are important for people to see, and I put it in my work. And so this image, um, Sing It Like You Mean It, is something that, <laughs> that has a long, a long history. It's a kind of a side note, a family thing, but that's kind of where the title came from. This other image is from a television still, still that I kind of reworked. Um, this is also, this is from Good Burger. You guys know Good Burger. Um, this is from a, a, a Pac-Man commercial, um, Black Panther Pac-Man commercial from the 80s. It's a little kid with like a little beret. He was eating Pac-Man cereal. This was a presentation live. Um, it was called On. It was at Pioneer Works. Um, it was a presentation where there were 13 uh, stages where um, each setup um, was a stage of, a perform of performers. And it, it was created as a thoroughfare uh, of infomercials. So the people that I invited to participate, they, most of them were not performers. They were people with like very unique personalities that I felt worked really well for what I needed. And I just think that just the basic um, natural uh, personalities that I feel we possess sell a lot of stuff. Like 
a lot of things that are sold in the country in America when it comes to items are represented by black figures. A lot of the things like if you want to sell cleaning agent, it's like a black woman talking about how sad, how you can clean it. This clean so good, blah, blah, blah. You know, if, you, if it's a certain type of food, there's a fast food with a black woman talking about how good it tastes. Or if it's a pair of sneakers or something like that, as a black athlete talking about it. It's, you know, and it, and it goes way back to like the writing of the writings and, and uh, the documentation of the, the, the representation of black imagery on objects in America and around the world to sell products and it exists now and within our culture we understand these things and so this work is really highlighting the influence um, of that and so this performance which was live happened in the gallery everyone was mic'd up I had a mixer so I mixed everyone's voices together and separated them but it sounded like you walk into a thoroughfare in like a big marketplace and so you can hear all, all these different people trying to sell things I created an object that was an anonymous object that had a name on it. And so the performers, were not, they didn't rehearse. I just gave them the product, that box. The box had a, a name on it. They had to sell it. And that was the performance. And so um, this is uh, another image of it. These are some stills from the performances. This is the performance. I can do that. Product to the next level. And let's face it, you're basic. So I'm in the box yeah. all yeah. the way this month. We've been waiting all this time. It's extra. Ooh, okay. that it was you have okay. three <laughs> installments for $2.99. This special is only here today for $2.99. Three easy installments. And if that doesn't work, We'll package it any way for you, but you're going to get more for less. We'll make sure uh, that the like pricing is so great. I know you're on the I know you're on the If you haven't heard about okay. Extra, you got to start listening, start paying attention. People are talking about Extra. The way I see everything, I'm talking at three, but now I only have one. So what's better about one of a kind than three? Tell me everything. I mean, there's free ones of a kind, free. I don't care and about like the, the way I've gained. Colorful isn't a secret. It is power. I can use my money to get a star. I don't want to get an extra Oh, hey. So, new and improve is this magical box that you can just place anywhere you want and it does whatever you want for it. I mean, this, last time I was trying to cook, and I, you know, I. I was in the room. I was in the room while they made even better than before. Are you serious? I mean, everything was great. Everything was. Just great, and then, I did not know that. Yeah, I was I was with the special yeah, creator. Yeah. Yeah. He was like, it's perfect for all right now. One hundred two seven two seven to get extra to get tickets to extra. If you have extra tickets and you and you want to give them away, you need to call me because I will sell them on your behalf. Because uh, everybody's looking for extra. Thank you for telling me. Thank you for coming out. Yeah, I know you had the, the barbecue. Everyone likes pants. more for less. And you know you like more for less. We like more for less. Absolutely. My life changed once I got more for less. And I wouldn't be here if I didn't have I wouldn't be here if I didn't have Tasty. Are you hungry? Gosh, I'm so hungry. So I, I, we're going to get the chef on, and we're going to get you um, a little bit of knowledge on recipes, on things that we can do. With, but is it filled with sugar? <sighs> well, only if you want it. Only if you want it. That's how I feel. Like, you know, it's like, you don't really have everything. I can do you want it. It's like, 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 I love that performance. It was great. Uh, you know, sometimes things that you like could be joyful. 
you know, in that particular performance. And this is his excerpt. The performance was, you know, live action, in-person performance. That's just kind of a condensed version of that um, actual happening um, at, the, at Pioneer. Um, that was also a part of installation. This other room was a meditation room where the color bar um, audio was uh, at a pitch that was more of a meditation pitch. And the image in the far back part of the room was, um, let's see, hold up. It was an image of, uh, wait a minute, it's not going. Wait a minute. It's not going. Oh, the arrow's not going. Well, this particular image right here, I'll get to the next image, but this particular meditation room was using the color, the color bar audio as a form of relaxation. But on the far, far wall, there was an installation in the sculpture of night lights. And the night light images um, that were on the sculpture was a portrait of Miss Cleo. And I don't know if you guys know who Miss, Miss Cleo is, but Miss Cleo was a, 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 a woman from Florida a native from Florida who adopted a Caribbean accent to tell people their fortune. And uh, she was very big. Um, and I grew up with that in the 80s. She was very prominent in the 80s. Um, that she later found out when she wanted to go solo that she did not own Miss Cleo as their image representation. Um, and I thought that was really interesting because she tried to do something. She tried to take Miss Cleo on the road and she was not able to. So this particular piece was like an homage to Miss Cleo that she actually passed away during the time of this actual opening. Uh, this show was up, um, I think 2018, 2017. Um, but that was, uh, I'm trying to go to the next image. Yeah, I don't know why it's not going. But that was kind of like the break between media. Oh yeah, that was to do that. So that was like the break for me in that installation because everything else was very animated, very active. It was really more about um, participating. This was more like the kind of wind down part of like uh, just decompressing and really understanding and meditating on representation as it related to the projection of the image of media. And Ms. Cleo, I felt, was a perfect example of this idea of spirituality being projected through media. You know, the idea of a black woman guiding you on your life experience, someone you've never met. And the fact that have her having a Caribbean-ness about her, this head wrap, this kind of ancestral uh, representation uh, made her seem more authentic. And to me, I thought it was funny. I grew up laughing at it. and. Um, and it also became like a tagline, like, you better call Miss Cleo, or, you know, it became like this thing <laughs> that happened within the culture. So for me, as an artist, a lot of things that I, that I make work about are really just going back in it now, thinking about it now as an academic, thinking about it now as a, a person who thinks critically about the influences, about how do we get to where we are, how I am what I am now. You know, media is a big contributor to representation in the way that we see ourselves right now. And some things that you think were very dismissive in media and things that you watch as a kid are some of the, con the, the biggest contributors to self-representation in the way you feel, in the way you feel in empowered or less empowered. And so that, that, this particular body of work was really focused on that. And I really thought about that. And this particular series, um, called Lamping, and it was really, it kind of went, the media, the whole installation went from this idea of the output of media and the influence of selling ideas and belief systems and things like that, which was the performance, and then the, the room of meditation was really trying to understand the representation from a more spiritual level, if you can think about media in that way, and then these particular uh, objects that were these, were these lamp sculptures, that illuminated were really more about the idea of actually knowing um, these things, understanding these things for what they are, 
And, you know, because media, you know, you're not really going to change media because media is designed to sell things. So the idea of understanding media is thinking critically about things that you see in media. That's the only thing you really can change. The only thing you really can change about what you see is understanding those things to be true or false. And that's the only thing you really can teach people. You can't teach people to, um, like, to not look at media or to not be exposed to ads. Like, that's impossible. There's things that are all around us that we're looking at from our, you know, from um, not even directly, just from uh, our peripheral view, we're looking at things. And it's impossible for us to really say that we only see things from one particular place. We're looking and seeing things from all around all the time. So these particular figures I call lamping are more like luminaries. And so these particular representation are mostly uh, figures that are uh, female. And um, again, like I was saying before, I have a large family of mostly women. <clears throat> and they, anybody that know me know that they rule if they're around my family. The aunt, my aunts are very strong fi uh, figures. And this was directly influenced by them because when they come around, they already talk about the past, which most people in most families, black and white, a lot of the women are the ones who carry families' history. They come around together, they talk about like childhood, they talk about different people who they grew up with. They kind of carry this other whole history that I always love to hear, even if I heard it more than one time. I'll listen to it over and over again. I never say, I heard this before, or you said this before. I just let them say it over and over again because I like the girlish uh, mannerisms and laughter that happen when people who mature talk about their history. It, it really uh, enlightens me in a very interesting way and really inspires me. So these, piece, these particular pieces are based on that. Um, it's a close up. This is also, you know, getting to another series, looking at emojis. And this particular series kind of started like in 2018, 2019 is when uh, variations of tones of emojis actually started to exist. It did not exist. This work was really more timely. Before I made this work, right before I made this work, there was only one emoji color. What happened is the influence of, uh, of blackness made them add more color. That's what happened. People just don't add other colors of emojis that people aren't using them. The reason why is because black people using and then they started making their own and they started actually doing things that were not monetized. And so as a, as a way to keep uh, black uh, viewership and participation, they incorporated other tones to keep people interested in using the platform. And for me, I really thought about that as a really interesting media uh, advantage uh, to think about in art. So these particular emojis, I started to think about representation and portraiture. And so these were really uh, like thinking about language, thinking about hieroglyphics. I started putting two types of emojis together to represent figures in cultural uh, history that I thought these two images kind of represented. This one was Whitney. This was Neil deGrasse Tyson. I mean, if you see it, you know it. Yeah, it's like you just know it. You know. Um, and when I made this, people were not feeling. They were like, "What are you talking about? What is this mess?" And you know, sometimes as artists, you just got to make what you make. You know, like everything does not have to be successful to everybody when you make stuff. I make many different types of things and I have to make it. Like it's not like it's like I'm not making a like I'm not asking people, do you think I should make this? I'm just making it to get it out of my system so I can make other things. And sometimes you have to make certain things in order to get to other things. And so that's how I work as an artist. I don't think of anything that I'm making as being successful or not successful. I think it's all about getting things out so you can make space for more things. And so this particular series was really based on me looking at an opportunity to talk about a contemporary topic through visual culture. And so these works kind of came out of that. And moving to like the, the kind of more current um, works, I, really, I spent time during, you know, over the pandemic, 
again, looking back at like movie trailers and thinking about TV and thinking about things that, again, uh, I thought represented, represented me. And so I started to kind of think about movie stills and media and things that appeared in like screen captures of movies. And I don't know if you guys ever noticed, like in 90s movies, it's always like a scene where people are walking past a billboard. I don't know why. It's like, that's how they show that you're in like an urban street. It's like someone beating on a drum outside like a plastic bucket and then they're walking past like a, like a walkway billboard of an old movie that existed before the movie that was made to tell you that things don't change. It's really, that's what, it, that's what they're trying to tell you when you see an old movie of a current topic or current theme and you see an old poster on the wall, it's really saying things change but they stay the same. And so it's like certain language that in film because film is also something I studied at Columbia. I start to really understand the way film also can really exploit certain understandings and lack of understanding of framing ideas that are real and made up. So this particular series, <clears throat> I you know, kind of infused different things. And so Soul Plane, I don't know if people saw that, but everyone should see Soul Plane. It's not a good movie, so don't look it for that for that reason. But Snoop Dogg is in it and Monique. So you can't lose with those two people in it. So um, this particular painting was more of, of kind of representing this idea of like, uh, what is taste? You know, what is valued? Um, those things. I think I present a lot of things that may not be valued by other people, but they're things that are valued by me. And I remember a really interesting conversation um, I had with my mother about Tyler Perry, which I don't really watch, only I watched it with her. But she said to me, um, one day I was at home with her, she says, uh, you want to watch Tyler Perry? And I said, mm, not really. She said, uh, why? I was like, I just don't want to watch it. She was like, why? I was like, I'm just not into it. She was like, why? Do you think he's like too exaggerated? Do you think he's, she started giving me all the things that she thought, that I thought, that I, why I didn't want to watch it. And I was like, yeah, that's it. And she said, well, I like it. Huh? <laughs> That's what she said. She said, well, I like it. And that's all that mattered, you know? So I, thought, so, I, so I think about those when I'm making my work, like the idea of being passionate about what you like and, you know, and the influence of knowing difference when you are in certain spaces. And honestly, you know, when you think about people in different cultural communities, they really don't, understand, they don't, they really don't start to think about what they're missing until they start to engage with other communities they realize have more opportunity or have more access. That's when we really start to really think about what we're being denied. And so without that, we usually are able to thrive in our communities in a way that we feel successful. And so this particular work right now that I'm showing, um, they call motion picture paintings, were really more about composites of ideas that related to cinema as I imagined them to be and presented them as, in an artwork. <clears throat> this is uh, SWA, Sister with an Attitude. This also is a very important uh, painting for me because it really highlights a very important uh, um, series that was on PBS that was taken off of CBS by uh, during the Nixon administration because of its political uh, exposure and criticism of the presidency at the time. This particular show called Mr. Soul was a show that was really highly promoted on PBS. It was a show that highlighted not only uh, entertainment, music, poetry, dance. It um, also brought in political activists to talk about things that were on topic within the community. It was in Harlem. It was a very popular show. I think it was 59 episodes. You should look at it on um, Amazon Prime. You will not regret it. Um, the show was very amazing. It was like a variety show um, in New York at a very particular time. And the way that it was taken off is that uh, they had lobbyists join the board of PBS. And when they took over um, and numbers on PBS, they decided that you know this show was no more, longer relevant because the civil rights had been successful, which was funny. But anyway, um, 
You should look at the shell, Mr. Soul. This is another work, again, kind of looking at uh, TV, looking at sitcoms, compositing images collectively to create an image. And so, you know, again, you know, this particular body work kind of going back to P PBS is a station I really look at a lot, think about critically because it, it, it started off as a very political station. It has some politics now, but it's, you know, become like mo many networks more corporate. But C um, Sesame Street, which most people don't know, was created for inner city kids. It was considered for, it was created primarily, if not exclusively, to, hi to heighten the literacy of black and brown kids in New York City. It was created for that reason. That's why the beginning cast of Sesame Street had a heavy representation of, uh, of diversity within the cast. And when you watch Soul, the documentary, you will hear some of the, you will actually hear the Sesame Street theme song played by a jazz musician prior to being Sesame Street. So there's a lot of things that you will see watching this this show, Mr. Soul, you will see the influence of this show on other shows that are educationally based um, in, uh, on PBS. And so this became the influence of this particular body of work. It's, it was called uh, And Friends. And um, I kind of reimagined the idea of each kid had their own puppet. And what would that exist at? You know, what, that, what would that look like? I don't really make comparative things I'm not really concerned with how other people see um, how I represent the work and the images as it relates to blackness. I'm in my whole like black little world when I'm making things. And I'm thinking about the future of representation for other kids and other people to look at my work in the future. And the idea of representing figures that are primarily black within uh, the context of my work does not is not exclusionary. It's really, to me, I feel like it's evening things. I feel like it's actually, I feel like it's actually balancing things that were imbalanced. And the reason why I make these things is because they are not out there. And when they become um, more dominant as, in the way that people look at media and representation across the board, maybe I'll make something else. But until then, I feel that these images are very important to really think about. And these are things that I ponder about or or have to think hard about. I think about what I don't see, and then I make what I don't see. So it's not even about like me trying to be clever or me try to do something that I think is smart. I'm making things that I don't see because I know there's a place for them, and I know there are people who want to receive these types of things in that space. And it's, I've been fortunate enough to have uh, support from collectors who also believe that these things are important. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, hi, I just wanted to ask you, oh, thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask, so, given the history of this country, and generational trauma, do you feel like your work improves your own personal mental health when you're feeling the pressure of like Western colonialized America? Of course. I mean, I think that art could be therapeutic for so many people. And I believe that, you know, as an artist, when I go into my studio, you know, first of all, as a black person, you're already vulnerable. When you walk out of your space, Anything can happen to me. I don't care if I'm a famous artist. I could leave out of my studio. I could be falsely accused of doing something that I didn't do, which has happened to many people that I know. I could be arrested. I could be shot by someone within the community or outside. So vulnerability is something that is just obvious for most black people. So in my studio is my sanctuary. So I'm not going to bring anything in my studio that's not going to make me feel empowered and make me feel like I'm the center of the world. So my work is really bringing back this idea of centering yourself, even in your imagination, because that's the most important part when you think about who we are as, hum as humans. When imagination is gone, you're truly defeated. 
you know, and when you think about colonialism, colonialism has most empowered when people can no longer imagine themselves outside of the conditions that, in which they live in. And so for me, I know that the work that I make and the way it's projected into the world creates an effect of empowerment to communities and individuals that I'm trying to connect with. Can I, oh, hi, thank you so much. This is wonderful. Um, and I, I feel in my body just like vibrating from all the things you talked about, Miss Cleo and Soul Plank. So thank you just for allowing us to like walk through that and experience it. I'm just curious about like what you're watching or listening to right now. Like what's your relationship with media in this moment? Um, well, like television, movies? Yeah, television, movies, social media. I mean, something that struck me about what you shared is that so many of these things were part of not monoculture, but like moments when so many of us were watching the same things and the, th the thing, the moment on TV would happen at the same time and we'd be talking about it on Monday because it happened on Saturday yeah. or Sunday. So like just what are you watching right now and how are you watching? How are you listening? That's what I'm curious about. Thank you. Well, music wise, I listen to a lot of thing, things. Um, I'm not really into, um, well, I listen to everything. I listen to, you know, club music, rap music, uh, jazz, you know, it depends, you know, I go to my studio, I usually listen to R&B when I first come in, to, you know, I'm drinking my coffee, I might turn up to a little bit more, you know, something on by the end of the uh, middle of the day, by six o'clock I'm listening to some clubhouse music or something where I, when people start coming to my studio to hang out. Um, media wise, I don't, watch, I, don't really, I don't watch anything where black people are not empowered. I don't watch any movie where black people are being arrested or shot or being uh, like objectified. Or, I don't watch that. It is not that it's not happening, but TV for other people is an escape. For black people going to the museum or looking at TV is about reminding you of the trauma that already exists and you already know about it. So the idea of going, a museum was created for leisurely activities. It was created for people who want to go out and look at art and then go have lunch. Unfortunate side of the museum structure, because there's so much limitations of what black people can show and wear, when we are in shows, it's usually a darker theme, a theme that talks about trauma, a theme that talks about some level of, of being um, like oppressed. And for me, that's not what my experience, what I want to experience going to a museum. It's just not what I want to experience. Not that other artists shouldn't make it, and, they, and filmmakers shouldn't make these things, they can make whatever they want, but I also have the choice to decide if I want to go into that space. What I think is a great sh show is Lovecraft Country. I think it's like one of the best, and that's why they took it off. <laughs> that's why they only gave one season, because it's such a compelling uh, series that really captures all the things that we think about as black people and the way that we imagine ourselves to be and the power that we take was presented in that show. And that's the reason why it was not brought it back again. And that's the difference. When things are not, when things are for us, the chances of them being reoccurring are rare. When things are made to describe us to other people, they usually last longer. You know, so there's certain shows that are for us, and I know certain shows that I watch that are speaking to me directly, and there are certain shows that I know are for other people to understand me or the idea of it. So those type of shows I don't watch. One more question. One more. I first just want to say thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I really appreciate it because I'm not from Baltimore, but I'm from Maryland, and I had to drive through Baltimore every day to get to Towson, where I went to high school. So it kind of really hit home for me, like growing up in that environment. And on that same note, when it comes to impact, like uh, bringing black joy into the community, specifically into the city of Baltimore, I she gave all of like the many accomplishments that you've been able to achieve over the past few years and throughout your career. But ultimately, what type of impact are you aiming to leave on your community specifically? Well, I, one thing I learned a lot about 
looking at cities like Baltimore and Detroit and places where they are dealing with challenges, economic challenges. First, you have to really understand that those challenges are things that are imposed. Those are not in any way um, representations of how people want to live. That's number one. Number two, I remember coming to Baltimore, driving to Baltimore, living in New York. I moved to New York uh, 1993. I remember visiting Baltimore one time, and I was driving in the car with my mother, you know, who, you know, she works in a, most black people in Baltimore work for the state, the government, um, or the city. That's pretty much the economic structure of the city. Um, and I remember we were driving through the city, and the houses were kind of, you know, we drove through this neighborhood, and it was boarded up. And I was like, oh, man, look all this, pro look all this bo house brought up. It's crazy. And my mother said to me, don't be talking about my city. They were like, you moved to New York. You come in here looking all at these buildings. Um, don't be looking at this. Don't come, don't come home. You know, don't come home. And I understand that because we look at movies like History Channel. We look at Rome and look at all those ruins. And we look at all these other European countries where things are abandoned. And we see these recaps of what was so majestically happening in these buildings and how amazing things that happened in these buildings thousands of years ago. And we don't look at those buildings when we go to Rome or Italy or Florence and say, oh, my God, look at these buildings. Look at what these people, uh, how they're living. No, we look at these buildings because the framing of it made these buildings come to life. And the reason why we look at cities like Baltimore and Detroit as cities that are stressed in poverty is because we don't realize that people live there, that histories were made. Famous people lived in these houses, people who accomplished things, people who had families, people who made things happen in cities. And that's how we need to start looking at cities like Baltimore and Detroit. There's nothing wrong with the houses. Things happen. People migrate. People move around. Opportunities change. People move to the suburbs because in Baltimore, the reason why people live in the county versus the city is because it's cheaper for taxes to live in the county in Baltimore. There's more incentives to live out of the city to live in Baltimore. The same with New York. That's why people are moving from outside of New York back into Brooklyn. There's, there are things that are happening that are really political that people don't understand when you look at cities like Baltimore and Detroit. They, these things happen so the prices of property can go down so corporations can come in and buy up blocks and build what they want. So when you think about cities like Baltimore and places where violence is rapid and things that are happening, you have to look at the systemic structure of how things are built. Uh, Johns Hopkins would not be in Baltimore if Baltimore was that dangerous. University of Maryland would not be in the heart of Baltimore City if it was that dangerous. They're not in the county. They're in the city. And there's a reason why. There's more money in the city than it is in the county when you think about economy. So that's very important to think about when you think about cities like Baltimore and Detroit. It's so much more complicated than a, an abandoned house or people getting shot. Because when I go to Baltimore, my family is pretty regular. You know, my family is not the wire. My family is a regular black family that work for the state and the government. They sit on our porch, we eat crabs, we talk about different things. And to me, that's what my history of Baltimore is. And I think when I go to Detroit, which I was a couple of days ago, that's what I experienced in Detroit, regardless of the abandoned houses that I saw driving around. And to me, that's really important for us to realize when we go into cities like that and we look at blocks that are abandoned, realize that history happened there, people live there, important people live there, and no longer exist because of systemic structures that are set in place for certain people. And that's why I created the nonprofit that I created, because I believe that someone has to do it and I love doing it. So I love the idea of being an artist who is somewhat successful and being able to create spaces for other people in my hometown who can benefit from the things that I've achieved as an artist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.